adding words to your page. Why does that even matter? How does it matter? And why should we be caring about it? That's all on today's uh, episode of the Virt Virtual Art Gallery Workshop. As always, I'm your host, Christopher Epling, and we are talking about putting words to your page today. Now, there's a big misconception on how words actually uh, interact with the children's book. Mostly when we're talking about either chapter books or graphic novels or picture books, we don't think a whole lot about how words are placed or where they're placed or why they're even placed there. But there is an importance to those. Now, I do want to stress this, and this is how we're changing from the last workshop into this new workshop. And we need to talk a little bit about how you're going to put your book together in order to submit it for consideration for publication. And you don't have to really overthink this too much, but just look at it in terms of this. When you submit your book for print, your text has to be legible. We have to understand what it is you're wanting to say on each page, whether you hand draw the text or you type the text up and you place that in later on. So just as long as your text is very legible, will be okay but if you're hand drawing your text in there's not a lot we could do about that to change that later on and we'll be going into that in more detail what I mean by that um, as we look at ex as some examples from the last virtual art gallery workshop so just before we begin I'd like to take a second to recap things and look at where we are and hopefully where you are in the process of uh, putting your book together for submission so week one, uh, we decided basically what we're going to be drawing and what we're going to be talking about. Um, leaders or Legends is the focus of this workshop. So hopefully you, each and every one of you has selected either a leader, an individual in your community who's made a difference or your region. They don't have to be people who have been um, recognized by state government or anything like that. It could be someone that maybe you and only your small community know about. Or you picked a legend. The legends are a little more diverse in the terms that there's tons of superstitions and different myths and folklore uh, surrounding all of our regions and areas so there's a good chance that you could easily find or locate or discover a certain legend myth or um, um, superstition that you could write about now those were your two choices for this workshop and based on that then you went into your research research period where you're gathering all your information up on what you're going to talk about, getting your facts together, especially for the legend portion, when you're drawing or talking about or writing about a legend or a particular person, that person really lives. So there are certain facts that are undeniable. You have to have those facts uh, in your story, and they make your story um, whole at the end. Okay, And then the legend portion is going to be a little more broad because there's not as many um, maybe solid facts to go from. There's more um, you know, superstition. It's myths. So, the, the, these things and ideas that you're going to be pulling into your book are going to be things that aren't based in maybe any uh, true history or what we like to call nonfiction. So hopefully you've, you've chose your, your path you're going down and you're trucking along now and you've written your story. And your story, um, you've written it and decided what, what type of book you want to create, whether it's a chapter book, a picture book, or a graphic novel. And you've laid out your storyboard and you're beginning to um, work with your storyboard and finding out how your pages are going to connect to, together or uh, what, t what um, texts are going to appear on each page of your, of your book as you, as you put your storyboard together. Now adding words to a page might sound like one of the most boring topics in the world, but when you think about uh, craftsmanship and, and putting your book together from building something that didn't exist before you started to something that is going to exist after you're finished, well that can be an exciting uh, period. Uh, there's a lot of people who actually do this as a hobby. They create zines or mini comics or uh, small um, self-published type books where uh, they think about every little portion of their publication once it's finished. They, they, they want to be hands-on with the development of their, of their book in every way. And that's really what I hope for for this is that you became that involved within your book and creating your book and deciding what's going into your book or what your book's going to look, look like. Uh, of course, not everyone's going to be that involved. A lot of you may want to just get this over with by now, especially if, let's say, you've taken on a legion leader's portion and there's a lot more facts in there than you hoped for. Hopefully that's not the case. Hopefully everyone's having fun and everyone's enjoyed the workshop quite a bit. But in order for us to get an understanding on how words uh, interact and how words can be used uh, to enhance a story, we're going to be looking at some uh, very choice uh, examples that I think really um, showcase how uh, properly to do this 
Now, you got to remember something. You're submitting a book for consideration. So when you're putting your words on your pages, there's a few different ways to go about it. And we talked about this early on. You could type your words up and then paste those somehow and in, insert it into your book. Or you can hand draw these words or letters into your pages. Now, with those two options, we're first going to be looking at an example of a um, children's book. So this is a picture book where the words are both um, inserted and drawn. So this will hopefully give us a really good example on what we're talking about. So the first book we're going to be looking at, and we'll go ahead and jump to the overhead camera for this one. This is Supernova. And Supernova is, um, now these are all the loose pages of, of this student submission here. So as you can see, this is how we received the book. So exactly what you're looking at is what we looked at when the book came in. Now this particular book is uh, written by McGoffin County High School freshman Haley Marshall. And I want to take a second to look at the cover because text placement is important not only for the interior of pages but for the interior pages. Now what we did have to do for her book that, that hopefully um, we won't have to do for any other selected books this time is she, did for, she, she forgot to put her name on the, on the cover. Now, now this is something we do want to um, address right away that you should always have your name on your cover so be sure and put that somewhere on your cover legibly so that everyone knows who created your work now let's say you had an author and illustrator combo that's fine too it should be written by and illustrated by somewhere on the cover but then we start to look at the interior pages of her book and we can see by the first page here that um, Haley has decided that she's going to place her text of her page center top so that means right in the middle of her page now if you notice if you can see from the camera this is actually um, typed out text on eight and a half by eleven piece of paper and this has been trimmed and pasted and to glued onto the page so Haley has this effect incorporated throughout her book um, here again with the second page of her book. Notice how she has framed her text within a cloud. She's done this quite a bit with her book, which is a um, <clears throat> very, very cool technique. We talked about using your artwork in relation to your text. So what I mean by that is, if you were to type out your words, cut them out, and paste them on your page, think how you can adjust your artwork or manipulate your artwork to work um, to enhance the word somehow and this is a great example of how that's done she has uh, trimmed her, uh, her words out of her pages and she's actually uh, pasted those inside of a cloud on this particular page and this also takes us to another page here this is going to be the fourth page of her book where she has multiple things going on there's a couple of different scene changes here there's a dreamscape too so her words are in the middle of the page <clears throat> she's used almost like panels which is fine um, this is not a graphic novel though this is a picture book but there are no really set in stone um, guidelines or rules we have to go by the only rules is that 90 percent of the book um, uh, is made up of these full blown color illustrations such as this one um, a lot of her pages incorporate um, if not all of them except for a couple um, this technique of cutting out the page, uh, the, the, the word search story, and placing those on her page. Now, the interesting thing about doing this is she, in the creation of her storyboard, knew exactly what was going to appear on this page of her story. So before she ever started coloring or drawing the illustrations, Haley knew that this sentence of, she started to notice that her stars were looking a bit dull and dark she knew that this sentence was going to appear on this particular page. So before starting with her work of creating a finished page, she could craft her page around whatever text was appearing, okay? And this is just very skillfully done. I'm very proud of her for this. Um, here we have a thought balloon. She incorporates different elements in her story. Not all of them are um, strictly based in, in, in um, in picture books or what you think of illustrations, she incorporates some comic elements with thought balloons and panels into her work too. So she's done a 
few different things here. Now this is a really cool sequence. Uh, this is a sequence where the main character is again explaining um, the, the, what's going on with them in terms of how they're relating to their environment. And she says she sat for days through rain, snow, sleet, and hail, wondering what the problem could be. And she's really shown this sequence quite well in the sense that she's got these passing panels that are occurring. So we start out over here, and as she passes through um, the different segments of her sentence, talking about the different things that the character set through, we see this passage of time as well through the panels drawn for her um, illustration. And then this leads us into her further pages where she's continued to use this element. So this is one option that you have where you can type up the words that are going to appear on the page. You can insert those words somewhere on your page. And, you know, planning is involved in this quite a deal. Um, thinking about where you're going to place your text in a finished page or any given on, on any given page as well. So I really like how she completed this and how she approached this. I thought she did a great job. And now she has inserted some text here. This is part of the illustration with the board. Um, you see how she's placed Sky Park. So we have to know the difference between the written text of the story, which will appear here. This is the narration of the story. And then something that are words, but they're a part of an illustration. Now that's different than uh, the actual text to making up the story. And Haley just did, did a stellar job. So if you're wanting to cut out your text and tape those or paste those, I really highly suggest pasting those onto the page. Um, this is one way to go about it. And it, it makes for um, the process of us cleaning up these pages for print a lot easier because the words are very legible. Um, is, you know, she could also you could also choose to hand hand letter or hand write your words onto your pages where she's done at the end. But this is more of a part of her illustration than her actual story. So this is one just amazing example. We'll jump right into another example, which is kind of like uh, taking um, Haley's approach, but we're going just a step further with the Ugly Pumpkin. Uh, this is by Christopher Conley. And the Ugly Pumpkin was submitted um, from Millard Middle School. And so the illustrations have been collected into this book, but it's already been almost bound for us. Now, this is perfectly fine to do this. As you can see, um, this is what we call saddle stitched in, in the publishing trade. And what saddle, saddle stitch means is that it's pieces of paper bound together using staples, okay? And I'm not really sure where the saddle portion comes in, but that is just a publishing term. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, Christopher had some help putting this together by his teacher. And what, he, what they have worked on here is a, just an amazing example of incorporating um, the illustrations with the text so, so that there is, there's, there's no difference here in terms of um, what's been applied to the page. This is all one page here. Nothing's been glued on this page. So what happens if, if, we're, if you're going to go this far with it, you really need the help of a teacher or, or especially a middle school. Now the upper grades, you probably can handle this on your own. But what, it, what Christopher did is he, he or his parents went and purchased uh, construction paper. So this is hard paper. They, they brought that into their school office and they loaded the co um, copy machine up with this construction paper and they placed their text into the uh, page, uh, onto the, um, the glass to be scanned along with the artwork. And they made copies of each an individual page of the book. And once they had all the individual pages um, scanned and printed, they folded them and stapled them. So this is how this book was created. Now, if you th think of this in, in relation to our last book, which was um, Hannah Marsh, or, or I'm sorry, I've been butchering her name. It's Haley Marshall's book. Um, the text has been glued on separately, um, it, so it can come off. It's there. It's it's on top of the page. It's been it's been um, applied to the page to a finished page. This is different in the sense that the words and the text are a part of the page. Now this takes a little more planning. Uh, don't get overwhelmed by this. This is not a required. Um, 
end effect for your book. So if you do not um, put your book together in this way, that's perfectly fine. But I did want to show this as an example on what could could be. Okay, so that's a difference. If you wanted to go uh, this far in depth with your story, that's perfectly fine. If not, though, that's okay too. Okay. All right. So. Let's move on now and let's take another different, a little bit of a different approach. Now this is Al Could Have Saved the World. Um, this is from a uh, Ma Ma Martha Jane Parter Elementary student. It's a combo. Alex Kinzer and Cheyenne Holbrook created this book. And um, what they've done is they've placed their text inside the pages. Okay. So as you see, the story is handwritten. Okay. It's kind of a little bit of a um, different approach is what we've seen before. So all of the text is placed in one location on every page which is perfectly fine. Okay, um, And what has happened is the student has created um, a hand lettered book. Now if you're going to create a hand lettered book where you're handwriting in on every page the story, um, I do want to stress that your words and your spelling and everything needs to be very legible so you should be able to see it very easily okay it's very important that that happens um, but they did a great job with this and you can hand letter your stories now for graphic novels um, there's really no other way around it other than hand lettering we're going to be looking at a graphic novel coming up as an example it's really important as you're designing your pages again to think about where the words are going to appear. Now this should be done in your storyboard, storyboard um, phase. So for chapter four, and there's small chapters to this book, you should, th should they thought of this out before they ever started drawing their finished pages. So chapter four is here. They knew that this sentence was going to appear between chapter four and the illustration. This is something that hopefully you've thought about in your planning, that you have an idea of how things are going to take place and you've planned all of this out so once you start creating your story um, you're, you're just jumping right into working on the finished pages. Now most of their words appear in these kind of boxes at the tops of these pages and this is a little bit of a combination between um, again and you, you know using different elements so we have elements almost of a comic but um, it's more of a picture book and you can see how they've incorporated these panels, if you will, into their story. Now what might happen during printing is this. Um, if this book was, this book was selected for, for publication, so for the elementary level, grade level uh, category, um, one of the books. So what happens during, um, before this book goes to print is that these book, these pages are cleaned up. So this one illustration is pulled from this page and these words are then hand typed then onto the page. So there may be some changes done to your book if your book is selected. Okay, so just make sure, I can't stress this enough, that if you're going to place your words on a page, make sure that if you're handwriting those words, make sure you, 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 everything's very legible. We can read what it is you meant by a certain sentence and that, so there's no confusion and your story isn't altered at all. Okay. But this is a great example on, um, on how to hand letter your story. Um, it can be done. It's very easy um, uh, to do this in terms of uh, just planning. If you plan out what's going to appear on each page before you do it, then you should be perfectly fine. So that's a great example of hand lettering with Al Saves the World. Okay. Now let's go into graphic novels for a second. Now this is one of the most amazing graphic novels I've seen produced by uh, students, and there's two of these actually that were selected for uh, publication of the, um, the Virtual Art Gallery Workshop. And with these, graphic noveling is a lot different than your picture books or your chapter books. There's more, um, there's you know more drawings taking place inside panels. Sometimes panels can have, um, I mean, pages can have multiple panels. So let's say you've selected the graphic novel format. And we gave a parameter at the beginning of this that between 15 and 20 pages for a graphic novel. That's not a whole lot. If you were to go to any library shelf and pull a graphic novel off the shelf, you're going to see that some of those have a lot more pages than that. But for the purpose of the workshop, 
15 pages is a lot, especially since when you consider that for, for a, um, um, a picture book, it's one drawing per page. So on a graphic novel, one page can have you know, umpteen different drawings on it. So we wanted to be fair about that in terms of if you select this, different, this format, the graphic, no, graphic, graphic novel format for the virtual art gallery workshop, that you know, you, you're, you're not having to do excessive work as compared to someone who is selecting one of the other categories. But there's two graphic novels that were selected for um, the virtual art gallery workshops uh, public, publication um, for Stars Publishing uh, out of last time and those two were Deception um, by Sarah Colvin and Abby Webb and they were actually two students who were recently showcased on the PAC TV um, ver uh, art workshop that I host. Um, they came in and talked about their book Deception and then the other book is um, Chrissy Walters um, it's called Brutus and Rudy's Unorthodox Adventure. Now those are the two books we're going to be looking at and I don't want you to feel overwhelmed when you see their work uh, they went far and beyond expectations for this, but I do want you to try. I don't want you to say, well, I can't do that, and he said it was okay, I don't try, but, you know, let's just remember that these students were selected to be published, so um, they did something right, so we can learn a little bit from those. So the first one we're going to be looking at is deception. Now, these uh, pages are placed in these plastic um, page protectors simply because um, this is graphite and, and, and if you know and some charcoal so when you touch it um, you, you could smudge it really easy and we didn't want the artwork to alter too bad in between um, you know so, so we kept we kept these um, in, in these page protectors but deception is the title of, of Sarah, Sarah Colvin and Abby Webb's work and um, so as we turn the page here we can see that what they have chose to do for their work, it's a little different now. This is, a, this is technically um, a, a, a graphic novel in the sense that, that, that is, it is, um, that's, that's how she assigned it to the workshop. So she turned it in as a graphic novel. But you're going to notice something that this, this borderlines with, again, a picture book. There's full-blown full illustrations for um, what we consider one big panel is what we could look at this. So uh, she submitted this as a graphic novel. Now the other example is going to be more standard um, graphic, uh, graphic novel in terms of panels. So when she submitted this, uh, you could see that we have the words printed out on one page and then a full illustration here for the second page, okay? And I've noticed that with the last workshop, there was a lot of blurring the lines between different types of books, which is fine. I like that. Um, so you have a book that resembles a graphic novel in the sense that there's, you know, some panels on pages, but it's not completely a graphic novel um, because there's not multiple panels on every page. And then you had some picture books that resembled a little bit like comics in the sense that um, there were some boxes on the pages or panels. Um, there wasn't all full-blown illustrations. But as you can see, now she's a very talented artist. She, she is um, Sarah Colvin um, and Abby Webb both teamed up on this. They both worked on the illustrations and the writing for it. So their approach to this was to print out their words and then have a full illustration. And by doing so, enabled us a, a, in terms of setting these pages up for print because we can arrange this artwork how we want for the printed page, okay? And so we could put the words onto these pages um, where we need to, which really opens up a lot of room for us. Now this is a, a very interesting story. Um, it follows a main character throughout their, their uh, almost like a, um, a saga, if you will. Uh, there's supposed to be future books from this. But this is one way to go about it, okay? Now this resembles a picture book, I understand. But when we move then towards um, Brutus and Rudy's unorthodox adventure, which is, I'm going to pull it right in, slide it in here. This is a lot different. Now this follows what you would imagine a typical graphic novel, okay? Um, so here we start out. This is um, chapter one. This is page two of the book, page one of the story, okay? And inside here, we first start out with this full-blown um, panel. It's a 
full cover panel or full page panel. Um, we have our narration boxes. We want to remember when placing the words on our pages, we can use a few different things at our disposal for graphic novels. One of those are narration boxes. We talked about those already. Uh, narration boxes is, is where the story is being told to us by the narrator, but the main characters cannot hear what is being said or what is being told to us inside of these boxes. Whereas, um, opposed to, let's say, a thought balloon or a speech balloon, where that is direct communication between two characters. So here's another, uh, the first page, and we start to see now our panels. Our panels are being, um, now she has a loose um, style to her work. Her work is not very rigid or very technical. And um, here we can see, start to see some of the, the typical, as what we think of as being typical comics um, um, approaches here with the word balloons. We have the, um, the character yelling, so it's a little bit of a different border around the speech here. So she's incorporated all the elements of what we think of a comic book. And you see how she structured her panels. Her panels are uh, not the same on every page. In fact, as you remember with the first page, it was a full a page panel introducing us to the story, setting um, the environment and the setting um, right away and then we slowly move into the smaller panels where the story's taking place. So Christy did a masterful job of, of putting together um, her graphic novel. Each panel, as you see here, she's pre-decided upon before ever starting um, the final work with her book. Okay? And you have to do that. The planning is so important for this. It's so, it's so important to know exactly what's going to be taking place on, on your, um, in your story and on your finished page before you ever start, okay? So as you can see, Chrissy, has, uh, she's created this graphic novel incorporating word balloons, speech balloons, narration boxes. Her panels are thoughtfully designed. Um, just an, an amazing job. Now, we want to talk a little bit, and we'd be failing ourselves if we didn't, about chapter books. Chapter books are just as important. They're a category for us, and so we have to cover that. And while chapter books apply more so for the superstition or the legends portion of this, um, we still want to cover it. I know some students are thinking about doing a chapter book for their, uh, to, to describe their legend or their myth or superstition. So I, I found um, one that really fits uh, um, as an example really well and it's called Confessions of a Jailbird and this is from Taylor Bush and the illustrators Abby Hamilton from Betsy Lane and this book when put together just did an amazing job of putting together what we need for the words uh, in relation to uh, uh, the illustration so if we could take a look at that one for a second I think we'll be we'll be set so this is our um, example for a chapter book and I want you to pay close attention on what the illustrator and the creator of this, um, both Taylor Bush and Abby Hamilton, did for their story in submitting it. Now, they thought about what was going to happen when this book was printed, and they, they designed their, their um, submission around that. So what we received was this. This is a, um, there's a big paper clip here, or a big binder clip, I should say, with all the pages in between. The artwork, as you can see, is the cover, and then we have inside um, a sketched out, very loose title, right, with the names of the creators, okay? And you can see that the size of the book that they're intending on this to be. They do not want this book to be 8.5 by 11. They're intending on this book to be smaller, much smaller, maybe 8.5 by 5.5, okay? And all of the following pages then were created at this size. So they typed out their pages, okay? So they set their parameters up on their commu computer, their word processing program, and they typed their story. And then at the bottom we have page numbers here, see? So they typed their story up, and then what I meant by every so often we need an illustration, well, they provided that. So every so often there's an illustration in here, and you can see this is the sixth page of their packet, but page five of the book. That's why there's two different numbers. 
So if you're creating a chapter book, send in your material in this way so that your words are separate from your illustrations, but you've put them all together and you've nicely packaged these so that we know exactly what your intentions are should your book get selected uh, to be published, okay? So it's really important to think this stuff through. Illustrations for a chapter book do not appear on every page. They could, okay, but you're looking at a whole lot of work for yourself if you do that. Now, you could, you could do that, but what's expected of you is this, that ever so often placed sporadically throughout your story are illustrations. And these two creators have done that. But as you can see, there's, there's words up there on that page. There they are. There's more words to this then there are illustrations, but the illustrations do take place. So if you're deciding, uh, you've, I mean, you should have already started and you've begun work on your chapter book, whenever you submit that, think about how you're going to send it in to us, okay? Adding words to your page is an important um, aspect to your book. It can mean the difference between someone reading your book and, 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 and knowing the intentions you have or reading your book and being completely lost as to what's going on. So there's a lot of um, different parameters and different avenues you could go down with the Virtual Art Gallery Workshop. Most of all, and the, probably the most important, is be creative. You saw some examples here from the last workshop that were successful in how they applied words to a page. And so when you're creating your book and while you're working on your book, you have a few choices. You could print the sentences off, cut them up, paste them on your pages. You could hand write each one, each, each sentence onto every page. For a chapter book, you, you type up your pages and then you insert your illustrations and you put those together nicely as a packet to submit to us. And then also for graphic novel, you're dealing with a lot of more, uh, a lot more drawings on a page with the, inside the panels and such. So try to be um, uh, very deliberate on how you approach this. Your storyboarding is so important as we've discussed many, 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 many times. So hopefully you have planned and you've, you're having fun putting together your book. So, and you get into better ideas today of why words matter. Where you place words on a page matters. Just as we considered with Supernova, um, her placing a few sentences inside of an illustration, like inside of a cloud or or, or likewise. So I hope you're having a good time. I hope this has been an enjoyable process. And just remember, if you're, if you're stuck on something, go back onto the holler.org, look at the past um, sessions, watch those over. Um, you can even go, go all the way back to last year, last school year's virtual art gallery workshop. Watch those presentations and sessions over. There will be a tutorial created for this week, but it won't be until after Thanksgiving. So we are in week six. There's only eight weeks. Of course, we always give some time at the end for you to get everything together. So it's not like as soon as week eight happens, it's done and over, everything stops. Uh, we'll work with you to get everything together so that you get it submitted. The first published books for the students from this past school year is going to be available coming up in the spring. It takes time to publish these books. Um, students that were selected will receive copies of their books to be working with um, UPIC and, and um, setting up a business model for their business so they'll be able to um, leave the gate in, in a successful way hopefully. So thank you so much for participating. I hope you're enjoying the process so far and until next time keep drawing.